We are back on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk 1180. Our guest by phone, Margaret Hoover. So, Margaret, what do you think? Is, is, this, is the 4 to 1 spending advantage that uh, Romney had over Gingrich that big of an issue, and will it be an issue for the Democrats and the Republicans in the general? I do not think Republicans are going to have a disadvantage with money in the general election, and the reason is because of Citizens United. Uh, because uh, there are these super PACs now, there are these C4s, you know, even just the, the first quarter numbers came out this week. Uh, last, I'm sorry, fourth quarter numbers for 2011 in terms of fundraising. And do you know that President Obama and the DNC raised about $25 million less than, than Mitt Romney and the RNC? Really? Nine, $93.4 million the RNC raised last quarter, 2011, and Obama and the DNC took in $68 million. So, wow. and, and what you're seeing now, also these super PAC numbers are coming out for uh, Mitt Romney's super PAC, for Newt Gingrich's super PAC. They raised $40 million last year. I, I just, there, is, there is not a dearth of, of, of people who, of course, it's all transparent, so you know exactly you know, who these 14 people were, individuals were, that wrote million-dollar checks to, to Mitt Romney. Or, but there, because of this, there's, um, there's going to be more money in politics, and, and maybe you know, everybody has an opinion about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but at least the unions don't have the advantage. You know, at least more people can put more money in, and there will be, I think, no disadvantage between Republicans and Democrats in in, in this uh, general election, which I think is a good thing. I, I don't think it's better for Democrats to have an advantage because unions can pour in money and, and Republicans don't have unions. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm, you know, as much as it's, it just seems nuts to have, you know, billions of dollars going into political campaigns, I would I would prefer that than to have one side have an unfair advantage. Okay, now one other thing that came out of Florida, I thought, was um, they, they said that 92%, <coughs> excuse me, 92% of the Florida ads were negative. People were complaining about them, but they worked. Is that what we're going to see the rest of the campaign and going into the general is now we're going to start with the, uh, you know, the negative ads and all the, you know, crap all of the people have to put up with on, on TV for the next seven months? But, well, you know, I, I hope not. We all hope not. Nobody likes going negative. But the problem is, as soon as somebody goes negative on you, if you don't respond back, your numbers start going down. That's just the, the dirty reality and the sort of the rotten truth of, of politicking. Uh, the suspicion for a long time, the reigning wisdom and knowledge, such as it is, quote unquote, in the Beltway, is that this is going to be a very nasty election. Part of it is because President Obama doesn't have a lot to run on in his record that's popular. And since he can't tout his health care reform because it's so unpopular, he's going to have to double down and go negative against whoever he ends up running against. And uh, there's been a suspicion for a long time that this could be, you know, among the, you know, most laden with muckraking uh, presidential elections that we've had for a long time. You know, I want to go back to Florida for a moment. Um, it was a winner-take-all state, but now I understand Newt just filed a, a lawsuit saying that it sh- really should have been um, percentage based on votes. Grasping at straws is what I think. Oh, do you? Um, you know, it, it, look, this is this is going back to the rules the RNC has set up for for a long time with Florida, and even if look, say he gets a percentage, he you know he'll only walk away with let's see, there are 50 votes in Florida. He got uh, 12 percentage points less than Romney. So say he gets. You know, say he comes out with 20, right. 20 votes. You know, this thing is going to go in, by the way. This does not seal the deal from it. I mean, this thing is going to go on for a while. There aren't really, in February, you've got some caucuses, but no primaries until the end. Uh, you've got Michigan, which is proportional. You've got Arizona. I think Arizona's winner take all. Then you're going to go into March. Super Tuesday is not going to be definitive, by the way, because they're all proportional. Um, so you're not going to start getting real winner take all states until April. Later in April, like April twenty after April twenty fourth, so this could go into May, even June. I mean, we I hope not because it'd be great to see the party rally around somebody. I think. Um, well, I do think the 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 horse race between Newt and Mitt has made them both stronger candidates. Uh, we we don't want it to get so nasty and ugly that the party's divided. I do think the party will come together and rally around whoever ultimately has the nomination, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, until late April or May because of the way the proportionality versus the winner-take-all happens. Um, the momentum certainly shifted. I, it's hard to see how Newt wins Arizona and Michigan, uh, but he'll probably come away with some some votes because it's proportional. Uh, and, and then we'll just keep plodding through. 
Um, I, I just can't see how, you know, an extra 20 votes in Florida is going to make all the difference, especially when he's not on the ballot in Indiana. He's not on the ballot in Virginia. Um, so I, it right. seems like grasping at straws. Mm-hmm. At this stage of the game. Our guest by phone is the author of American Individualism, Margaret Hoover. So, Margaret, how does Santorum uh, influence all of this? You know, I, if I were on Santorum's camp, I would say stay in, stay in, stay in, because there's a chance... Uh, that that the the conservative vote that has really rallied around Newt, um, you know, you just never know what's going to happen with Newt. Uh, and and Santorum does bring something to the table. Frankly, I think his presence in the debates has been really important. I think he's he's elevated the level of of policy discussion in the debate. And frankly, I think him talking about. Uh, Rust Belt middle class Americans who have been caught in the crunch of globalization, have lost their jobs, and and they're hurting. I think that's that's important. That's really important for Republicans to be talking about. And what I hope is whoever the front runner is, if it isn't Santorum, which it isn't now, and it doesn't look likely to be, uh, though anything can happen, uh, that that they they take on some of this this talk and this um, to sort of the addressing some of these policy issues that he's brought to the forefront. So I think. His voice is really important in the debate, and frankly, he's got um, conservative support, which could still coalesce around him if something goes wrong with Newt uh, as the alternative to Mitt Romney, as, as they keep saying. Yeah, he could be a viable candidate. He kind of reminds me of a guy, though, who's sitting at a card game, and he knows he's got the second best hand, but he's got to stick around because he just might win it all. So, you know, he, he's kind of in that limbo land, like you say. Uh, but he, he keeps fighting for it, and you got to you got to admire his his family, his perseverance, yes. his faith. I think all all of that brings a lot of richness to the debate and to the race. Not a question. Yeah, Margaret, I I kind of get the feeling that that the establishment doesn't want Gingrich. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, Bob Dole, you Tom Delay, you think? <laughs> yeah, you know, they all they all came out attacking They're him. They're getting that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you think maybe, <laughs> but you know I listen to you know to Bill O'Reilly, your your partner in crime, and Rush Limbaugh, and you know I'm, I'm listening to the two of them, and I'm thinking they're saying the same thing I remember. I mean, I remember the '90s, and I remember, you know, Gingrich was pretty much the guy who uh, who brought Clinton back to the center, and and you know created that that budget that was so fantastic. But uh, he's not getting any credit for it. Why, why does the establishment not want Gingrich? Is it because they don't think he can win? I think, it, let me just tell you how I feel about Newt. Because, I, I mean, my, with the, day, the only day my parents let me skip school when I was in high school was uh, I was either a junior or senior. It was, 19, uh, it was 1994, so I must have been a, either a sophomore or a junior. And it was the day the Republicans took the house back. And we got my to daughter's skip age. School. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> exactly sorry. Your daughter's age. We got to skip school. We got to stay home. We got cable news. That's when we got cable news so we could have C-SPAN. And we got to watch the Republicans taking back the gavel. We got to watch Newt Gingrich talking to the freshmen, talking about how he was going to get his uh, contract of America through, how they voted on all those, uh, what they did in the first 100 days. Actually, they got all the votes done through through in the first 93 days. I have huge respect and admiration for Newt Gingrich, and he really did shape the 90s. Uh, and, and, and was a leader, and he was an insurgent leader. He's a very good insurgent leader. Uh, but there's, you know, as we've all seen, there's good Newt and there's bad Newt. Uh, and, and you know, the, the downside of Newt is that, uh, you know, he's sort of this, <laughs> he has these wonderful ideas, but the joke in Washington is that, you know, of 100 ideas that Newt has, like three are brilliant, uh, 20 are okay, and the rest are, are terrible. <laughs> And uh, and he also can get in his own way a little bit. Uh, what we saw is that he took back the House, but then there was a massive coup against him, and he was forced from power you know, less than four years later. Uh, that, that, frankly, the, the deal might have happened uh, with, with Bill Clinton in terms of before the government shut down, but, but Newt lost his temper. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's, there's good Newt and there's bad Newt, and I think he's a complex guy. He's had a huge amount of success, but he's also had a share of share of failures. And uh, you know, when you have Newt, Rick Santorum on the on the stage debating him, saying, you know, I was part of the freshman class in '94. I was part of the Gingrich Revolution, and and it failed because you failed us after four years. Pretty powerful. So, Margaret, what you're telling me is you don't want to buy a view lot on the moon when we have the colony there once President Gingrich establishes. Yeah, I mean, it. I. I, I can't figure out. I mean, I can't figure out why Ron Paul hasn't told him to be the first colonizer. <laughs> Ron Paul did say he'd wanted to send some politicians. Send to the moon. politicians there, I know, but I mean, why, why does he send his principal competition there? Why is Ron Paul hanging around? I think Ron Paul has brought 
you know, again, the same way Rick Santorum has brought something to debate, so has Ron Paul. I mean, he has a very fervent, strong base of support. He's talking fiscal responsibility. He's talking fiscal discipline. He's talking uh, talking a lot of sense to a lot of people. He's and talking frankly, isolationism. He's started to take in some of... Uh, some of Ron Paul's ideas and incorporated it into his own stump speech, into his own platform, uh, so that he's still adding to the debate. I, I, you know, I happen to disagree with him on foreign policy, uh, but I think he's, and I don't think we should go back to the gold standard, but I do think his message really resonates with youth when he's talking about fiscal security and fiscal discipline, because our policies are generational theft. They are robbing the fiscal security and future for my generation, and, uh, and that resonates. When we come back in a moment, we're going to ask Margaret the uh, qu- the million dollar question: Who does she like in the Republican uh, process? Here, we'll be back in a moment on taking care of business on Current Radio News Talk eleven eighty.